Viewers have asked me what the most important parts of Volt are when you get started. Today I'm going to cover what I believe are the six most important. Once you understand these six things, it's easier to understand the framework. Let's take a look. The first concept I'll cover is Opal. Opal is the foundation on which Volt rests. Opal compiles Ruby code to JavaScript, and it can run Ruby in any JavaScript environment. It's already in production use today on several apps. Opal makes it a point to adhere to Ruby semantics with very few exceptions, which means you get to use cool features like method missing. You can also write your front-end tests using RSpec. Let's play around with some Opal to see the magic in action. I'm using FK Chang's Opal Playground. It's perfect for testing out small Opal scripts. This script is using the Opal jQuery gem, and it lets you do DOM manipulations with standard Ruby code. Check this out. First, just like any jQuery script, it waits for the DOM to be ready. Then it finds the first button on the page. It attaches a click listener. And when that click event gets fired, it calls an alert dialog that says, hello world. Let's try that out. And just like that, we wrote JavaScript code using Ruby. So that's the first concept you need to know when you're learning Volt. Using Opal will replace JavaScript in the framework. The second concept relates to concurrency and callbacks. Opal and Volt are both event-based. You can execute a request and do other work while the request completes. This provides a performance boost, but comes with some caveats. Application logic will execute out of order given this architecture. So how can you get anything done in Opal if code is not executed synchronously? You do that by using promise objects, which may be familiar to you if you write JavaScript already. All of the asynchronous methods in Volt return promise objects, and understanding their usage is essential. A good example of an asynchronous method in Volt would be when you do a database request from the browser and it has to call back to the backend server, fetch the record, and then bring it back to the browser. This is a very costly operation, and you can speed things up by using a promise. Here's another common use case for promises when you're using the Opal jQuery gem. Calling http.git performs an AJAX HTTP request that responds at a later time. You tell the library how to process the returned data by calling dot then and passing it a block. The block gets executed whenever the request completes. The same is true for failure cases with the dot fail method. The dot fail block executes any time a request error occurs. Spend some time familiarizing yourself with this syntax. It's a core part of Opal and is essential to using Volt. It's particularly true when dealing with database operations. In this example here, you can see I did an AJAX request to this URL and the JSON came back right here. It's all happening in the browser. There's no backend interaction whatsoever in this particular example. Now let's move on and talk about models. Volt data declarations are very dry. You only define your data once, regardless of what the data store is. Here's an example. Let's say you're writing an app that has a database, but also uses HTML5 local storage. Despite the fact that you're storing your data in two locations, you only define your model in one place in the application. Here's an example found in every Volt app. The syntax is pretty intuitive. There's one thing that might confuse new learners, though. Volt models allow you to define fields ahead of time. One example is the user.name field that was declared as a string in the user.rb file that I just showed you. That doesn't mean that Volt models have a schema, though. They don't even need you to declare fields ahead of time. You can think of Volt models less like active record models and more like persistent hashes. If you've used MongoDB before, which by the way is what Volt uses, this shouldn't be too surprising to you. Volt models are schemaless and accept any number of attributes at any time. Watch this. Did you notice the underscore in front? That's called underscore notation. 
It's a way to define any field on a model, even at runtime. It's like square brackets on a Ruby hash object. You can call any attribute on any model as long as it starts with an underscore. But what if you still want to define your model fields ahead of time? In that case, you can define the fields like we saw earlier. You can access those fields without using underscore notation. It really depends on your use case and your preferences. There's a few things to be aware of, though. The first thing to be aware of is that if you pluralize an attribute name, Volt assumes that it's an array model, and I'll cover what an array model is later. There's an example. I have not yet defined a field named friends on the user object, but it went ahead and created a new Volt array model for us. Also, if you attach an array to a model, Volt automatically coerces that into an array model. Same thing that we saw last time. Third, if you attach a hash to an attribute on a model, Volt will convert that to a model as well. In that last scene, I mentioned the array model class. Future versions of Volt are going to call that a collection, so you can substitute the word collection and array model interchangeably. They're the same thing. Collections represent a group of objects in Volt. They allow you to search and also apply reactive rendering of members when you start doing things in the browser, like displaying a list of HTML items. They can also persist to MongoDB, HTML5 local storage, or the browser's volatile memory. Collection objects give you a uniform interface that is independent of the data store. There's a few exceptions to the rule, but they're very rare. If you're familiar with Mongoid or Active Record, the syntax will feel very familiar. Here's a quick example of how they work. And we saw part of this in the last scene where I covered models. But basically, they act in some ways very similar to plain old Ruby arrays, but they also give you a active record or mongoid-ish uh, where syntax for doing querying. And of course, they also give you other methods like dot destroy or uh, letting you access members of the collection. So that's all there is for concept three. You can group Volt objects together using array models, and future versions of Volt are going to call that a collection. The fourth concept is what would be called today a store, but in future versions it's going to be called a repository. Like I've already mentioned, there's many places to store your data in an application, but what makes Volt different is that those storage locations are modular. This saves you the hassle of writing data transfer code. The most used repository is Store, and that's a MongoDB adapter. Another popular one is Page and Local Store. There's plans to add SQL adapters in future versions, but that's still under the works. The repositories follow a pretty intuitive API, like the one you see here when we insert a new record into the database. And just to make sure, I pulled it back out of the database after doing a restart. You can see it's still there. So there we go. To wrap up, Volt supports multiple persistence layers using objects called repositories or store collections, and they share a mostly consistent API across storage mechanisms. Now let's talk about controllers. I saved this one for last because I feel like it's the most important. So here's what you need to know about controllers in the Volt framework. First thing to know is that controllers are not the same thing as a controller that you might find in Ruby on Rails. They're more similar to a controller in AngularJS or a view model in KnockoutJS, if you're familiar with either of those JavaScript frameworks. The main job of a controller is to support view, the view and to hold UI state. The second thing you need to know if you haven't figured it out already is that controllers are a completely front-end concept in Volt. This is important to remember, and let me show you this example just to show you what I mean. So as you see in my index action of the controller, I have a put statement. I haven't saved the file yet, but uh, you might think that this is going to print to the server log. It's not going to though, because controllers are for the front-end. They run in the browser. Watch what happens when I save this file. Do you see that? 
it went to the browser instead of the server log. If you're coming from a Rails background, it's important to know that you can't use controllers for security-related code. Writing security mechanisms inside of a controller in Volt is an anti-pattern. If you want to do that, you need to use a task object or use model permissions in those use cases. And I cover those in Episodes 1 and Episode 9. That's about as far as I'll go with controllers for this episode. So just remember that. The most important thing about controllers is that they're used on the front end, and they're actually more like view models than traditional controllers that you might be used to in the Ruby on Rails world. And so concludes our quick journey through the Volt framework. Those are the first six concepts you need to know, and I think they're the most important when you're just starting out with the framework. So I hope I've been helpful. If you like this episode, I've got some recommended next steps for you right here in this slide. And as always, feel free to leave a comment or subscribe to our newsletter to be updated about future episodes. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.